All right, welcome to Integrate Online presented by West Virginia University Reed College of Media, which offers renowned online master's degree programs in marketing communications. In today's session is being hosted as part of ComFest, an annual week of events that celebrate those working in marketing communications with the goal of transforming how people see the industry. Thanks so much for joining us today. We'll be discussing predicting trends for an unpredictable 2021. I'm Whitney Drake from General Motors and a graduate of the WVU IMC program. I'm joined by Chauncey Burton, Marissa Hacker, Joseph Jaffe, and Hugo Perez. Please be sure to keep your mics muted for the session and send your questions using the chat feature. Why don't we do a little quick introduction? I'm gonna start with Hugo. Good morning. Um, my name is Hugo Perez. I am the founder and chief strategist at a local boutique firm called Local Boy. Um, I am based in Chicago and I work with um, clients of all sizes to help them uncover the common thread of their brand stories so that then they can effectively impact the world around them through the stories that they tell. i um, been teaching at um, WVU in the graduate program um, for about a decade now, and I'm excited to be here today. Thanks so much. Marissa, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Marissa Hecker, and I am the Director of Experiential at Complex Networks based in Los Angeles. Um, if you're not familiar, Complex Networks is a global youth entertainment media company reaching Gen Z and millennial audiences across various verticals like sneakers, music, pop culture, and sports. Um, currently in my role, I'm responsible for developing cross-functional processes for our events division. Um, our events include ComplexCon, which is our annual tent poll, um, bespoke uh, brand partnership events, and soon to be Complex Land, which is our inaugural virtual event experience taking place in December. Um, prior to Complex, I've held various marketing and operation roles at Conde Nast, MTV, and Hearst. Um, looking forward to a great conversation. Thanks so much. Chauncey, why don't you take it away? Absolutely. Good morning. My name is Chauncey Burton. I am currently the context director for Translation LLC. Translation is a culture focused agency um, working on a wide variety of brands and initiatives, really kind of finding the, the bridge between culture and brands um, and the industry, as well as music and sports and a lot of different. Um, uh, verticals. Um, but um, previous to that, I've worked in a lot of different capacities, several experiential agencies. I've managed execution for Ad Color, Essence Festival. I've worked for the NBA, as well as in media planning with Starcom and P&G and a host of other brands. I'm very excited to be here. I will actually begin teaching a course at WVU um, undergrad starting in the spring. So very excited to um, be a part of the family and be here today. Welcome. It's a great family. And last but not least, Mr. Jaffe. Well, hello, everybody. I like to uh, basically uh, introduce myself now, uh, what's called BP and, and AP, before the pandemic and after the pandemic. So it's kind of like a walking dead type of uh, analogy. So before the pandemic, um, I was a consultant. I was an author. This is my, uh, my fifth book called Built to Suck, The Inevitable Demise of the Corporation and How to Save It. Uh, and, and a public speaker, I actually created a course which I teach at WVU based on Built to Suck, this whole idea of survival planning, strategic, pl uh, strategic planning basically for brands in an age of uh, constant disruption, risk aversion and short termism. And after pandemic, I became the host of Corona TV. I started a show that's all about hope, positivity and optimism. And if there's time left over, a little bit of marketing and uh, I've been doing it every single day. I've done over 125 uh, episodes and I'm not gonna stop now. Great, thank you so much. All right, let's get started with a few questions. Um, I'm gonna ask the question and then I'll ask you guys, one of you guys to answer and then we can kind of rotate through the questions. So the first question is, what marketing trends have you seen emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic that were not projected to excel in 2020. So I'm gonna flip it around a little bit. So Marissa, why don't you take this first question, please? Yes, of course. Um, so what marketing trends have I seen emerge? Um, I would say, I mean, virtual events, period. Like they, they were not 
um, in the consideration coming into 2020. Um, 2020 was projected to be bigger, larger than life, the uh, coming on top of what happened in 2019, like for example, ComplexCon, we executed two, two events in 2019 and we had the plans to expand internationally. And now, you know, we had to pivot and see how we can still, you know, leave our, um, our stake in the event space and pivot into a virtual experience. Um, other trends that I've seen um, that have, you know, take, uh, that have become more prevalent in 2020 is, uh, you know, marketers pushing the message of, you know, it's safer at home. This is what you should do at home, like consumer packaged goods, promoting recipes to make at home, um, theatrical releases moving to um, streaming platforms, um, home gym equipment, you know, for example, my Peloton, that's, you know, something that I see has Mine comes Sky tonight. <laughs> I'm counting down the days. <laughs> yes. Um, so those are things that I've seen that I, I'm predicted that it has not been um, were going to be so successful this year. Great. Joseph, what about you? What, what did you see in 2020 that you weren't expecting? 2020? Yeah, that's yeah. and then no, that no, might lead into 2021. No, that's my answer. 2020. I was not <laughs> <whole> expecting. <laughs> I was not expecting 2020. It apparently came because I didn't forward that uh, chain letter to 10 people. Um, so, no. Look, I mean, if we've learned anything in this year, it's that all of our long-term, long-range, uh, drawn-out uh, strategic planning functions are basically completely. Um, you know, sterile and, and, and null and void. Um, we've learned that whatever we thought and what, whatever we knew to be true has been just turned on its head. And it's really two types of companies that have done well or are doing well. It's the companies that actually had long-term visions in place already, and clearly the ones that have been able to pivot uh, and adapt. So, you know, if we look at, um, at 9-11, you know, what security uh, became to 9-11, hygiene is to 2020. Um, and right now we're all going through this, this weird phase of, of coming to terms with this, this world, like virtual, for example. Um, but at the same time, as time goes by, becoming more and more comfortable with this, you know, with this new normal, which is clearly uh, business as unusual. The only thing I would add uh, to that, you know, the point about virtual is, is, you know, I keep saying this, the most important thing that I pray is that we don't go back to our, our old ways and our bad habits. And this is everything in terms of humanity and, and justice and equality, inclusivity, diversity, the, you know, the evolution of capitalism, the, the, you know, goes on and on again. So for example, with virtual, we've been able to do things with virtual that are so much more efficient uh, and and frictionless and and more you know uh, than than the old way of doing business, and so my hope is that when we go back to this kind of new normal, we take the best of the old, we combine it with the best of the new, and we come and we come out at the other end with a much better solution. And clearly, that will apply to everything, including but not limited to education. Great, thank you, Chauncey. What about you? What are you seeing coming out of this that you didn't think would excel this year? I think that's coming out of it, and it's actually exciting to me, is that purpose matters more than it has ever been before. Um, 2020 has been a crazy year. There's several crises taking place simultaneously. The pandemic, we've got the economic recession that's um, looming. We've got the climate dynamic that's going on. We've got the racial injustice that's taking place across the, the globe. Um, and so all of those things, um, individuals really want to understand and believe that um, obviously the government cares, but that also brands are concerned. And so I think that the interesting thing is that there's been a conversation about purpose and a lot of brands have connected in a lot of different ways to really be able to um, connect in a different kind of way. And so I think that's the interesting trend that I've seen that's actually um, hopeful and I hope that it continues um, in 2021 and beyond. That's great, thank you. And uh, last but not least, Ugo, what about you? Yeah, adding on to what Chauncey and, and Joseph said, um, I, I would say it um, along the lines of authenticity. Um, from a marketing perspective, we're seeing 
a resurgence in a commitment to being true to the reality of life and being okay with challenges. I've seen so many great campaigns throughout the years and interactions from brands that are just saying, you know, we're struggling too. And we don't, we don't know what to do. And we want, you, you know, we want to help you and we want to walk alongside with you and we want to figure it out. And I think those that are able to do that um, with realism, with authenticity, with commitment um, are the ones that are really going to excel. And then one other thing that I've seen um, that I thought was, um, I, I teach a course um, in influencer marketing here, and that's part of what I do in my career as well on the side is manage a lot of influencer stuff. And the influencer wave has kind of been moving around. And towards the end of last year, it was kind of crescendoing on these super influencers that were getting paid big, big bucks to do these campaigns. And then the pandemic kind of happened and all that kind of went away because big bucks went away. Well, that gave a resurgence to the more micro and very local influencers that were able to get in and continue conversations going. And that gives me a lot of hope in terms of um, combining authenticity and realism with the authentic voices that we have all around us. So I'm excited for the world of influencers. I think that's a trend that um, is continuing to move forward and will continue to move into um, next year. Uh, one other thing that I saw um, um, come out this year that um, a lot of us, you know, that work with brands struggled with in the past was this whole idea of showrooming. Um, so often we struggle with people checking out our products online and then not going into the stores to buying. Um, with the switch to so much digital stuff that's happened this year, showrooming has taken on a new life. And I'm particularly um, impressed with the brands that have been able to, and the mom and pop shops particularly, that have been able to add in kind of like FaceTime shopping where you dial in on a scheduled appointment and they walk you around their showroom, their, their store, and they show you products and they say, hey, what do you think of this? And you have a conversation. I know I've bought many gifts from my nephews and nieces by um, FaceTiming with my local toy store and having them walk me through the shelves and showing me what's good. I love that. I'm going to have to keep that in mind as Christmas looms here for me. Uh, that's great. Um, you touched on something and it's a question I was actually headed to, which is um, with budgets being impacted for 2021 because of the pandemic, and a lot of us are in the midst of budget planning, it turns up pretty hot and heavy in this, the last few months of the year, if you're not done already. Some people I know are done. But um, how can marketers make an impact with potentially lower budgets? And maybe if you're working with a client, how do you help them understand that you still have to invest in you know, uncertain times? Do you want me to jump in as? Yeah, go ahead, follow up on that one and then we'll go back around. Sure. Um, I, I think we have to be very clear and very real on the expectations and, and the call to action that we're trying to get. Um, because everything is so tight and we're not getting the flow of traffic, um, we need to make the, the steps towards action much shorter, much easier to accomplish. So I say things like, you know, the FaceTime, shopping is a great idea, um, but tie that in right away. You know, maybe they can register with a credit card or something on your um, business account right away so that they can do the transaction quicker and not have this hemming and hawing. Um, I think paid digital is really important to continue to get out there and people are much more scrolling on their phones right now, keep in front of them and be authentic in the messages that you're saying. So I think that's important too. Um, and then, you know, uh, being realistic that you may not hit the same goals that you had in the years past, but if you are clear on your value prop, you might be surprised. I, I have a, a client friend of mine that um, is in a space luxury vehicles, um, never thought that they would hit their goals at all. So they switched their whole approach and they just started doing a lot of value add marketing. Just let me tell you cool stuff about um, luxury vehicles, and they just started doing this um, weekly newsletter that they never had before. They have since met and surpassed their goals from this year because what it did is it brought the attention to the brand in a way that it showed that the brand cared about them and was interested in the things that they were. And even though it's a high ticket item, they were able to convert people into brand lovers and more than just brand likers by just being part of the community and being real with them. Awesome, thanks. Chauncey, how about you? What about budgets for 2021? 
Absolutely. I'm going to lean in to make sure everyone can hear me. I know we've had some audio issues, um, but um, not to kind of beat a dead horse, but I feel like it ties to my previous um, statement about purpose and really being able to connect to a purpose and making sure that the brand is a Hugo's point is authentic and consistent in that messaging. And um, another kind of side part to that is diversity. So diversity, you know, it drives empathy and the empathy drives excellence. And so those things actually help to build the brand from its core, um, which then in turn will ultimately help the brand continue and to communicate with consumers for them to then continue to purchase and to buy and to engage with. So I really think it is connecting with a purpose, having a direct vision um, and being consistent in the messaging that is out to the masses. Awesome. Great. Uh, Mr. Jaffe. Yeah, I mean, I would say as it relates to budgets, there, there are two uh, of these truisms, or at least one truism and then one more current uh, interesting development. The first is companies and brands that invest and continue to invest during tough, challenging, even recessionary times, almost always reap the rewards of doing so uh, when things normalize. So there's definitely value in keeping the lights on and, and, and keeping those wheels turning. At the same time, um, Procter & Gamble recently announced that they're pulling out of the upfront. Um, so they're definitely changing the, the, the way they think about allocating their dollars. Um, and, and quite frankly, in this time that we're living in, uh, there really is no seasonality anymore when, when kind of every day looks like the one before and the one in front and, and everything's blurring together. So uh, the, the hope from a budgetary standpoint is that we actually start to rethink the way that we plan and invest and allocate. Uh, do we need speculative budgets, contingency budgets? Um, you know, are we planning for the next crisis? Because there will be a next crisis. So when you put all of that together, um, we definitely see some kind of a triangulated solution that says, yeah, we got to keep on keeping on. But at the same time, we have to make some changes. So what, one of the things that I've been quite, I would say, outspoken against is all of the brands coming out with their, we're all in this together during these unprecedented times. You've probably all seen that video collage that was put together that basically shows just vanilla that, that you know, by themselves, the brand might have thought they, come, they came out with something compelling. But together, they just look completely unbelievable um, and, and, and really, really just flat. And so what requires and what is required are for companies to actually be able to say, and I think someone mentioned it earlier, hey, we haven't figured it out. We don't know what's going on. Help us. Work with us. You know, one of the most important things during, you know, Black Lives Matter is actually not talk. All brands do is talk, even if they've got nothing to say. When, when all they needed to do is to say, you know what, for once, we're actually going to listen and then get back to you with some kind of action or some kind of intent or, or decision. And so, you know, of course, budgets are the common thread, the red thread, because, you know, it requires money. But at the same time, according to what Ugo was saying, you know, we can be smarter with, with what I call non-media, earned media, owned media. Um, we can create compelling things to say and compelling channels and vehicles to say those things. And we don't need to be traditional and, and quite frankly, old fashioned. Great, thanks. Marissa, you wanna add on a little bit there? Uh, yeah, just a couple more points. Uh, everyone made great points already, but I believe with lower budgets, this is like a great opportunity for marketers to be more creative and nimble with their messaging. Um, for example, a targeted social media campaign can have such great uh, ROI if you, you know, target your right consumer. Um, you're, you're putting out a highly curated messages message that goes to the exact consumer that you want and that can increase the ROI. Um, additionally, I've noticed that partnerships and collaborations um, with like-minded businesses can help get your message across. For example, I've seen Chase Sapphire um, over the course of the pandemic build upon their relationships with Instacart, Peloton again, and DoorDash. And I believe you know that gives a boost to those respective companies because you are going to Ugo's point is minimizing that barrier to entry, minimizing the challenge it is to access those products and um, uh, experience it. 
I think you raise a really good point. There was a string that a friend posted um, to that topic, which was what crazy thing have you bought during the pandemic because of targeted social media? And I have to tell you, I bought a ton of stuff because of targeted social media. And exactly. partly it's because I can't leave my house. Partly it's because I'm on probably more than I would. And partly it's because I'm just enjoying the fact that they, their logarithm is right. And I think it's cool and I want to buy it. So I think that's a, a wonderful point. Um, one of the questions Whit from- Whitney, I keep getting packages arriving at my house because I bought <laughs> so much stuff and I forgot. And I keep oh, yeah. getting all these packages. I'm like, I can't believe it. The, the, the thing that I'm doing is getting me. <laughs> Yep, exactly. The things that we have built up were, are now targeting us and we're, yeah. we're buying things. So oh, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great point. Um, I, there was just a question from Bridget about how many of these trends do we think are short term and which ones do you think will stay? And I'm going to start with um, Joseph because I know virtual events has been a pretty hot topic. Like I know they've been big this year. I know we've moved in and out of them in different times, like you mentioned 9-11 budget. So what do you think? Are there ones that are short term? Are there ones that are here to stay? And, and how do we walk people through that? Our clients I mean, or I, companies? It, it, it's a good question. And as I said, you know, before, for example, I, I, let me give you an example. The way I used to live my life would be that I would be living out, you know, out of a suitcase and I would be flying every single week. It's not efficient. It's not efficient to be on a plane all the time, just like it's not efficient to commute. You know, when we spend one to two hours a day commuting to the place that we work to live in our, you know, and operate in our little cube farm. So, so what comes out of this? What good can come out of this? Well, the good that can come out of it is the ability to, to say, well, maybe we do move towards the four day week or work week, or, or there is a compromise in terms of finding a balance. Um, and I said, you know, education was another example, but let's just go back to the whole, the idea of putting on an event, um, the ability now, for example, for a keynote speaker to pre-record their speech and to actually be able to watch that 24 hours in advance of the actual event. And then instead of actually seeing them deliver a canned speech with all the technical glitches and, you know, and all the problems and you're sitting at the back of the hall and you can barely see them in the front of the hall, now you, that person can give you a bit of added value or something you know, some, something that they, that they just thought of in the last 24 hours, or instead that time can be allocated towards a Q and A where, where you can really pick their brains or tap into their intellect and their knowledge. And you can still benefit from the real benefit of why people go to conferences and events anyway, which is to network. So, so it, it's the ability for us to like, really, I have a very simple, I, I teach this as well at WVU. It's a very simple two by two matrix, which is, you know, which is reject the worst of the old, keep the best of the old, embrace the best of the new and reject the worst of the new because there's still so many bells and whistles and fads and tactics in search of strategy. So for me, I feel like we're all artists right now and it is our ability to discern what is real and what is fake. You know, what, what, what is real uh, in terms of substantial and tangible, relevant, strategic and what is nothing more than than misdirection. And I'll just give you one more example. Uh, yesterday on my show, I had this fascinating conversation about memes and meme plexes and, 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 and the, the fact that TikTok, right? Brands used to, I mean, this, this blew my mind. Brands used to co-opt culture. Brands used to influence and create culture. But now culture is co-opting brands. And the example of that is, I forget his name, the guy who was longboarding with ocean spray, right? So right now, brands are just falling into the trap of being able to say, hey, somebody mentioned our, you know, our brand on TikTok and it's got a billion views. Let's go and buy the guy a truck. You know, so brands don't even realize they're being played right now. And, and so that is a huge shift that is happening in terms of understanding what our role as brands and curators of brands play in culture. So it's very exciting and challenging and scary. But again, you know, part of the art and our craft is to be able to determine what in fact has the staying power and what is just going to be kind of here today and gone tomorrow. Great, thanks. Um, Chauncey, you want to add a little bit and then I'm going to change it up and go to another question so we can try and get th through a few more. Absolutely. So I think the thing that's exciting um, about right now is the hybrid experience um, that's going to happen. And 
um, for example, with Essence Festival. I've worked with that program for many, many years in New Orleans, um, and it's been a huge event, over 500,000 attendees, major, major event. Um, and obviously this year it's been virtual. Um, the thing about a program like that or any of the larger scale events is you want an opportunity for those individuals who are in smaller markets who can't attend to be able to have that experience. And I think in previous times we've done that to a smaller extent. And I think now it's going to be a larger experience for virtual. And that's gonna be the benefit for brands as well as for consumers. So it's not just the individual events that take place. It's going to be to extend the footprint of the experience for individuals who are in other markets. And I think that's a great thing. And that's something that's going to likely um, stick around um, during pandemic and then after it, when the world opens back up. Great, thank you. That's awesome. All right, so I think this is a really interesting question from Allie. She says, there's still a larger older population who have not embraced the new technologies and geographical areas whose access to broadband are not desirable. Hence difficulty having um, adapting to the new technology. Uh, I thought it was very poignant for me teaching at WVU on one of our professor um, meetings where we were talking about students lacking access at home to internet and, and having to work in various places like parking lots and things like that to get access to the internet. So I think this is really interesting, not only from a targeted marketing perspective, but also from an education as we continue to drive in different places. So Ugo, why don't you take a, a stab at this one and then I'm gonna go to Marissa and then I'm gonna grab another question. So I'll split it up a bit. Sure. Um, that's, that's a really challenging question for a lot of brands and marketers out there because we all assume everyone has the same access, but I would uh, approach it a couple of different ways. I think um, this is an important time for us to consider localization. How do we get our message to really adapt to wherever the community is at um, in the ways that they're talking and engaging and then figuring out, you know, how to penetrate into that market. So I think, you know, as much as people uh, or pundits or whatever have talked about the cord cutting and um, getting rid of over the air television and stuff and going on streaming and on demand, there's still a huge portion of our world, of our society that still gets their television uh, or their information through broadcast television. So that, that's a medium. Radio is really important, um, continues to be a way, and that's an, an easier way for folks to engage with as well. So it's not only the flashy stuff, which we love. You know, I own a, a small film company. I love production, but I also understand the power of the message, of the story. And it's always it always needs to come back to the power of the story and which way can we get to penetrate into that market. So if it's an older group, perhaps it is through radio. Perhaps you know, you consider as a, a brand, you know, creating some kind of limited edition newspaper or magazine that you drop off. You got to think in the mediums and in the ways of the people that you're trying to engage and get them. I know that at my um, friend's house, I have grandparents that live with them and stuff. They still, I was at um, a, a relative's house this weekend and there were stacks of newspapers on Sunday morning because they still love to tear through the newspaper. So why not adapt that as a brand and market in that way instead of only thinking that we can do video? I think this ties in great, Ugo, to um, I believe it's Eileen's question, which was um, how do you handle screen fatigue, um, which leads to lack of engagement? I think we're all suffering from that. And some of our old school direct marketing techniques are, you know, making a comeback, like especially furniture. I can't go sit on furniture um, but I still like to look through some of the furniture catalogs because it's glossy and higher res and more in depth than what I can see online, right? So, Marissa, Whitney, I think of the I, really quick as a yeah. quick response. I think of the old Sears catalog that used yeah. to be such a big deal during the holidays. <laughs> How cool for a brand to put a catalog together, um, limited, you know. Obviously, yeah. we're not we don't we can't hit millions of people right now, maybe. But how cool would that be and how, how touchy-feely and connected to a, a nostalgia would that be and give us an opportunity? Well, and I think some brands have filled the gap left by Toys R Us, especially for the holidays. I know Amazon came out with a toy catalog, I think last year in Target. And I got it as a parent of eight-year-olds, the toy catalog is still a big deal and they are in devices all day long. So I yeah. think to um, Eileen, to your point, looking at alternate ways to get your message across are um, really good recommendations. Marissa, what, what else, what else you got? What else you want to add? 
Yeah, so I'm going to uh, alter alternative forms of getting your message across. I've noticed brands, you know, leaning into direct mailings, um, you know, producing these press kits that you can use to enhance your experience. So we're not in the event space anymore or physical event space anymore, but they still want to send out an experience where you can look, touch, taste, smell, and be a part of this uh, immersive experience. Like, for example, if a show that I've you know, is premiering, they will send out press kits to influencers or selected audience members. So just so that they can experience, um, you know, what the show would potentially taste like, what you would hear, what you would see. Um, and I feel like those are very effective. And for those who do have the technology access, they can reshare and be, act as brand ambassadors for these um, television shows. And again, going back to print and the magazine, the glossy, something for your coffee table that is still highly relevant in um, today's age. I'm sure the ad dollars for print may not be as high as it used to be, but having something to hold and take away and touch feel of the same points that Hugo mentioned is still very critical and uh, important to these brands. Um, I, I want to make a little bit of a contrarian statement, maybe, maybe two contrarian statements. First of all, uh, and I'm not just saying this uh, for you, Whitney, but um, the, the medium that I'm probably the excited, most excited about right now is the car, um, because the car is the ultimate mobile media, you know, panacea in terms of reaching the right person in the right place in the right time. Um, but it's really connected to audio, the power of audio. I mean, Joe Rogan sold his podcast for 100 to, I don't know, $150 million. Uh, um, this really is the age of audio. And you know, audio, audio just represents such a powerful, powerful way to connect because it takes advantage of what I call the third place. So everything from the commute to gardening to you know going on a run, uh, et cetera, you know, theater of the mind. Um, but the other point I wanted to make is I don't think this is about age. And I and I and I I don't think it's an ageist thing either. I think that we're seeing, um, you know, so so many members of what what would be called the mature generation or mature constituency becoming very very comfortable with audio, with streaming, with Zoom. You know, maybe it is because of their grandkids, uh, but at the end of the day, they actually have the discipline as well to sit back and enjoy and consume. And that was the big mistake that was made 10, 15, 20 years ago is that people were consuming blogs and they didn't even know they were consuming blogs because Google just told them that that was the most relevant you know, search result. So I think I, I'm very bullish on audio and I'm also very bullish on these new forms um, of content, whether it's streaming video or, or audio because you know, it is bringing so much diversity of content to people, you know, where they live. I think you raise a really great point, which is there's a difference between access to technology and age. So if you don't have access to it, it might not matter what age you are. And I am always proven wrong on age by my soon to be 80 year old father who learned to program as an adult and is constantly pushing, you know, new things in technology. So I think, I think you raise an excellent point. Um, and I do think we've replaced some of our audio commute with different, whether it's walking, running, or listening to it in the morning or on our in-home Google or Alexa devices now, right? We're, you know, I've added at least three devices in the last month to my home, um, which is another way to listen to or get messaging across. So I think it's great. Um, I'm going to switch a little bit from... Um, direct marketing back to digital with this question. And I want to talk a little bit about it in a different way. So Emily, give me a little leniency and taking your hijacking your question, but we've seen a lot of sites, um, social sites moving towards commerce features, including Ugo to your point about influencers and affiliated links and the ability to track what they're doing for a company, right? Do we think we're going to see that extend into 2021? Do we think it might morph or change? And I'm going to let Chauncey take a stab at it first, and then I'll circle back. Um, definitely e-commerce. I don't 
see it um, decreasing at all. I see it continuing to evolve and grow. I mean, a lot of the the larger players, the PNGs, the Mondelez, um, they are taking a stronger stance in e-commerce. Um, and even from a social standpoint, like what you see on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, I mean, there's definitely a, a stronger push for it. And I, um, I don't see there being a shift in that. I mean, I don't see a shift happening as far as the pandemic anytime soon. So with people being at home and the amount of um, at home consumption taking place, I definitely see that continuing to grow in 2021 and beyond. All right, Marissa, how about you? I'm going to let us all do this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. E-commerce is going to continue to grow, um, especially, you know, we're still in the pandemic. Like Chauncey said, there's no end in sight to this pandemic. And having that ease of a transaction from Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, um, companies and brands will continue to lean in there and get push their products that way. Hugo? One of the truisms of marketing that we learn is once you start showing a company how to make money, you don't take that away. And so e-commerce has revved up like never before. There is no way the company is going to say, ah, let's just go back to the slow way we used to do things before that was fine. So definitely moving forward. I also want to add a quick little point to the, the last combo, just because it's important about access. Messages can change and, and age doesn't necessarily matter, but um, access does matter. Um, I work with a lot of inner city communities, a lot of um, under-resourced people that don't have access to devices to listen to a podcast, that can't go and watch a digital stream. So we have to be conscientious of that as well. And so I know for at least one of my clients, we were able to source a small um, radio that was really disposable, but it was um, a Wi-Fi radio. So then they were able to do podcasts through that Wi-Fi disposable that cost about five bucks. But that, that takes a lot of mindset to get into that, to, to go in that direction. So be conscientious of the access. Sorry, I, didn't, I just thought it was important to not leave that from last conversation. No, that's great. Joseph, what about you? No, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, double, I'm going to build on what you just said, Ugo, which is just like affordable health care is a right for every single citizen of this country and every citizen in the world. So is broadband access and, and, uh, and every single company and, and the government should be obsessing on making that one of the top three priorities to make sure people have that access. So it's so I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and, and just being able to say it doesn't exist is an, is an unacceptable uh, response from the powers that be. Um, the only thing I would add to all of the wonderful responses is I, I'm always fascinated by new business models. And for me, it's, gonna, it's not just e-commerce, it's repeatable e-commerce. So uh, subscription, you know, we see the whole rise of the whole DTC revolution, but subscription and even things like, you know, Patreon and micro payments and tip jars. Um, I'm, I'm very, very interested in seeing how the largest of the large and the smallest of the small can incorporate these kinds of repeatable uh, recurring revenue streams um, because at the end of the day, you know, cash is king and cash flow, you know, is queen. Awesome. I'm going to take a page off of your affordable health care um, and, and go with a, a little bit more political question here. But it's basically, you know, things are unpredictable. We're less than a week away from an election. And so one of the things I think as marketers we do have to think about is, how do we advise our clients and organizations on local, state, national, political voting and results? And how do you prepare for the election, um, especially in maybe some of the, con like personally speaking from a General Motors perspective, we've been you know, actively engaged with the president over the course of the last four years. So how do you prepare for that? Sure, I know I'll that. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Joseph. Well, first of all, I, I had the privilege of having your uh, your CMO on my show, Deborah Wall, and just finding out um, what you guys have done. It's 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 remarkable how it took the entire company eighteen days to be producing ventilators, um, and how you lent into that, and just everything that you've been doing. So, kudos kudos to you. Um, you know, um, Jeffrey Hazlett, the ex CMO of Kodak, said this on my show. He said he said pick a side. 
pick a side, stop living and straddling and, and being all things to all people, pick a side. And at the end of the day, brands have got to decide if they're going to be on the right side or the wrong side of history. It's just that simple. Um, and it's pretty obvious, you know, it's pretty obvious um, what to pursue. I was blown away by how many of the CMOs that I've spoken to are not just sitting on the fence when it comes to, you know, justice and diversity and inclusivity and how they really, really um, are leading this change and revolution. So, you know, I, I kind of said at the beginning, which is the first thing that the brand should be doing is listening and then responding, but action is, is what is called for right now. And, and I believe that companies can, you know, if companies are not built to suck, one of the growth pillars in this book is this idea of being a corporate citizen. So corporations have the ability to be global citizens and, to, and, and, and you don't have to, you know, the, the challenge of course is to be able to say, but if we go left, then we're gonna, you know, basically offend right. No, it doesn't work that way at all. There can be a middle ground that builds the bridge that brings these two sides together. And I think corporations that have a spine, I mean, who was it earlier? I think, uh, uh, was it you, Chauncey, who was talking about purpose? Yeah, I mean, it, it is purpose. It is purpose and it is authenticity uh, and it is the ability to, to actually not just will a better world, but make it happen. Um, and so I think the advice that has got to come out is, you know, in fact, maybe there's no advice. You don't need to be advising. Advise through your actions rather than through your talk. Walk the talk rather than talk the talk. Great. Um, Chauncey, why don't you go ahead? I wanted to add to that a little bit. So that's a very valid point. And one thing that I want to call out is that, um, you know, you can't put out a fire by standing away from it. You have to actually get in there to be a part of it. And so whatever side of the spectrum that you are on, um, have a stance and then be willing to get into the fight. And I am fortunate to be at an agency now where we are focused on being disruptive. And I think that's really, really important and exciting. Um, and I see that across the board and obviously complex and some of the brands that you all work on, it is about being disruptive and operating in a space without fear. Um, it's easier said than done, but I think that's the important part. So to build on what Joseph was saying, it really is about, again, being authentic and jumping in there and drawing a line in the sand and having a definitive stance either way um, and then presenting that to you know your constituency your employees as well as your customers great marissa you want to add on yeah um piggybacking off of chauncey is i believe a key um tactic that brands can use is just getting the education out like sure everyone should be doing like their own research and education on where they stand on policies um lawmakers etc but um, from myself, coming from a brand that's a content creator, uh, I believe it's important that we push out this information and educate, you know, our younger audience who may not be likely to vote or participate in their civic duties. So um, I believe pushing that information, whether it be left, right, center, is critical for brands. Right. And this is why it's important to know what your common thread is, what your North Star is, this is not the time to all of a sudden say, hey, I stand for this. Hopefully you've already been that kind of brand that knows who you are. So when you start talking and taking a stand, it doesn't feel out of left field. It doesn't fall, feel fake. It doesn't feel like you're trying to capitalize on the moment. If you're not that kind of a brand or if you're working with a brand that's not, maybe now's the time to go back to what Joseph said, encourage the listening and let slowly start building your way in. Don't, don't become an opportunist just because everything's in the media right now be learn how to be true to yourself so that you can always speak authentically in all the things that you do awesome all right here's here's a little bit of a different type of question i think it's kind of fun but what companies should marketers follow to identify trends or gather inspiration as we go into 2021 what do you guys where do you guys get your inspiration and learnings i mean obviously in forums like this which I love, and it makes me so happy to be here. Um, but there are other, we're, we're usually voracious readers, we're teachers. Where, where do you guys go for that inspiration? I'll let whoever wants to jump in go first. Well, um, continuing on the theme of authenticity, to me, the brands that have really penetrated and had a lot of same power in my mind are the ones that because they knew who they were can market that way. And the one that stands out to me right now is, is Dove. They did this campaign, Courage is Beautiful, where 
um, they showed the, the mask marks that first responders had from wearing PPE um, all day long. What I appreciated about that is that continuing on in the authenticity of who they are as a brand, it wasn't a commercial to sell their soap. It was a commercial just to say, we are part of the community. And because you start to associate their authentic authenticity with beauty in that way, they're reframing beauty. All of a sudden, every time I'm thinking of, that pro of a product in this range, Dove comes to mind right away. I think that's brilliant marketing and it's brilliant because it's authentic all the time and all the way through. So I, I love, I'm a, uh, uh, I'm a TV watcher. I, I binge TV all, all day long. So um, I love commercials and I love short films and short movies that the commercials are. In fact, here's a plug. I have a course coming up next semester on digital storytelling, which is gonna talk about all this. I think it's a great way to get inspiration throughout the day. Awesome. Chauncey, go ahead. Jump in. Um, so to that point, as far as like the TV viewing and watching, I am also a um, lover of TV and streaming and all things film and cinema. So um, one thing that's interesting to me is kind of like Netflix and HBO and all of the, the streaming wars that are taking place. So it's really interesting to watch it evolve and how these brands are innovating from just kind of what they're doing as far as programming. Um, but then also some things they're doing as far as kind of going back into the experiential space. When I think about HBO and Lovecraft Country and doing kind of the drive-in experiences, there are brands that are still doing it in a way where it's safe, but it's also exciting. It's still experiential, um, but then also taking it back to you're at home watching a show that you love. Um, and then the other point to that is, I think it's interesting with Netflix and other streaming um, programs where as much as we're all experiencing screen fatigue um, and we need shorter, quicker, more snackable elements of content, but then on the flip side, you've got brands like Quibi that, or Quibi that just, um, Fold it. So <clears throat> it's kind of a catch-22, and I'm actually working on a project now for a financial company, and we're trying to figure out how to counteract that screen fatigue. And so we're talking about doing shorter segments and things of that nature. Um, and so it's interesting to see. So, for example, with Netflix, I love to watch a good movie, but there are times where I just don't have the bandwidth or two-hour window. So, like, currently I'm watching Shit's Creek. I love a good 20, 30 minute, I can watch it, get a quick episode and then go on about my business, come back to it the next day. So it's a combination of things and it's really um, resonating well for a lot of consumers. And I think that's exciting, not to mention just the content I think is phenomenal between a lot of the streaming partners. So that's where I get a lot of inspiration and I, I see a lot of exciting things happening. Great, thank you. Joseph? I mean, I, I'm a little bit more cynical about it just because I think there's so much opportunism. Um, uh, Bud Light just came out with this uh, this spot, two minute spot about this, which I just found beyond creepy, um, with this kind of cob, uh, like this cutout of a person at a at a stadium who then you know sees a a, a Bud Light you know vendor who who also is a cutout, and then they kind of move, and it's just it's just weird and. It, and I just didn't like it because it just seems opportunistic, um, you know, as opposed to a billboard I saw the other day for a company that's selling braces. And there's just a person with a mask on and says, now's the, you know, there's never been a more perfect time to get a mask, I mean, to get a, to get a, a braces. But, but I think really the, the, the most important thing for us to be focused on is, you know, the, the companies that, that are acting now the way they acted pre-pandemic that will act the same way post pandemic. And of course, at the top of that list is Nike, you know, and, and so those are the companies that will survive and thrive. And the other ones that got distracted and, and got too opportunistic will be here today and gone tomorrow. So, you know, one of the things that, I, that I've said to a lot of brands is, you know, the companies that came into this pandemic that had, you know, the buffer, that had that, that wiggle room, those are the ones that have the whole, you know, that at least have the ability to get it wrong and make a few mistakes and figure it out and come out on the other end intact. But the ones that were on life support um, are probably not going to make it. And, I, you know, it's the sad truth, but it is the truth, you know. And so I think the, the thing that I would just, you know, say to all of you guys out there, especially, you know, students and as you become marketers or, or whatever it is that you choose to pursue is, what you always want to let is strategy lead tactics. There are too many tactics in search of strategy. There are too many solutions to non-existent problems. Solve a real problem, meet that unmet need and let strategy lead you forward and you will not be led astray.
Great, Marissa. Yeah, um, I'm gonna sound like a plant from Peloton, but Peloton is <laughs> the brand that I've uh, I've been loving what they've been doing. Um, you know, it's a stationary bike that doesn't go anywhere in your home. I believe they're doing such a great job of fostering community and making sure you feel like you're connected to someone else um, that's not in the same house as you. Um, they have weekly, monthly promotions where they're highlighting different um, community groups. Like for example, there's Black Girl Magic, there's Moms of Peloton. Um, they're leaning into the different um, cultural events like Hispanic Heritage Month and promoting content and developing programs that lead into these um, critical and um, important um, initiatives that their members uh, may align with. So Peloton is my vote. I, I just wanna add something to what you said because it's so, it's so important. Peloton existed before the pandemic. You know, so so all this has done is accelerate their success. So just like we've seen the pandemic accelerating demise, it has also uh, accelerated inevitable uh, success as well. And a lot of people say that COVID, uh, you know, was the the responsible for digital transformation. It wasn't. It was responsible uh, responsible for digital catch up. You know, which is not a condiment, right? Digital catch up. That's all. Transformation and true disruption is about being able to kind of look at a business model and turn it on its head. And so Peloton is a great example because they had all the fundamentals in place and they, you know, so we might kind of point at, or Zoom, right? We might look at them and go, well, they got lucky. They woke up one day and just suddenly like, you know, there was a money tree outside, not at all. You know, that was the result of the fact that they had planned. You know, they say luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Yes, sir. I, I would add to that. Um, there's a lot of brands that have been trying to throw things against the wall during this pandemic, see if they stick. And there's a, those are the ones like you say, Joseph, will probably will not survive in the best ways. The ones that were thinking of who they are ahead of time, even before any of this nonsense happened, will continue to thrive. Valerie just brought up a great point, which is it's it's brought other companies maybe back to the forefront, like Blue Apron, um, Hello Fresh. I think many of us had tried those brands and maybe had gone back to, to our own thing, but they're able to make a resurgence and, and being at home and ordering things and trying different things. I think I know a lot of people were doing a lot of meal planning and meal posting about midway through this because everyone was just, we weren't eating out very much and we were you know wanting to try new things. So I think that's a great point. Um, one of the, it's kind of a statement versus a question, but I'm just going to bring it into here, which is in the B2B space, we're having conversations about how to showcase our machines to our manufacturing companies virtually, and then being sensitive to likely having budgets reduced. So the question is when you're doing B2B, how do you change things up in this, you know, you know, normally you would show people a machine or a, a piece of equipment. So how do, how do we look at that differently? Ugo, you want to try and take a stab at that one? Yeah, I go back to that idea that I, I talked about earlier about the, the virtual showrooming. Um, there are There is so much technology available that allows you to bring someone in. Um, this is a space where not only, you know, virtual consults um, are possible to walk through, um, but the area of um, AR and VR is really something to consider yeah. as well where you can create experiences that give you that reality, that experience that exists. And in the B2B space, there's an expectation often that we are a little bit more advanced in terms of how we present our equipment and our technology. So that might be a consideration. And then one other thing that I've seen um, that's worthwhile, um, especially because we're limiting is um, perhaps doing a walkthrough um, video experience with someone that a potential customer or a customer um, analog that can walk through and ask the questions as if it were somewhere else so that there's that interaction as you're walking through um, the, the showcasing of the technology of the equipment of whatever it is so that it doesn't just feel like you're pointing the camera but it feels like someone's asking and trying to figure out how does this work for me in a real good way. Awesome, Marissa, how about you? Um, I mean, Hugo nailed it. I <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have too much else to add, but That's all yeah. good. the just building upon like the in in world experiences, like going back to the decal and AR and VR. Like I I was thinking that 
when we do get back into the normal world, this normal smarter world, um, we can build upon digital experiences within the physical experience. So like a directional decal on a convention show floor can turn into this AR experience where um, users can you know, have that second virtual experience that can, you know, if they're not feeling too comfortable being around other people at the time, they can lean into that. Great. I, All right. I, Go ahead. And I'll, yeah, I'll just add quickly that I, I think that um, I'm so glad that you guys brought up AR and VR. The reality is what, what really happened through this period is that, I mean, I, I bought my Logitech camera, you know, on, you know, fell off the truck, you know, of a truck somewhere. I must have paid 10x, you know, I, I, I literally bought it from the mob, I think. It was so hard to get, you know, a microphone or a camera or lighting. Um, so the world is playing catch up in terms of being able to meet that demand. But when it does, every single person is going to be armed, you know, with, with the right lighting and the right camera and the right microphone. And the next part of that will be AR and, and specifically VR. Um, and that's just going to just completely take virtual to the next level. The other thing I would say from a B2B standpoint is this is the most glorious time to be in B2B, you know, where, where you know, subject matter expertise and thought leadership and, and, and again, the ability to stream and create these compelling uh, channels. There is a best practice in B2B that says people don't care much you know until they know much you care. Well, the new best practice in this pandemic is helping is the new selling. And, uh, and so it's a great time to be in the business and to take advantage of all that native technology from FaceTiming to video, to walkthroughs, screen shares, um, you know, to be able to deliver the intimacy. I'll say one more thing, which is, you know, what's happening right now is you guys are all about four feet away from us. So you're in our personal space. This is the most intimate that we can be. It is actually proven, research has shown you know, that, that we are so close to one another right now. And so that intimacy, if done and executed really well and creatively, even with all this Zoom fatigue, can lead to very, very compelling outcomes. Even just the ability to do cocktails, you know, and have a couple of, you know, drinks responsibly um, with someone and do that in an environment um, with creative backgrounds, et cetera. Um, so this is a great time to be in B2B. Awesome. Add to that, um, speaking to a little bit more B to C, but um, talking about Peloton and let's talk about Peloton versus Soul Cycle. And so I love Peloton as well. I used to be a Soul Cycle aficionado before I moved to San Antonio, obviously before the pandemic hit. Um, but you know, thinking about brands like that, and while individuals are no longer able to go to classes in the same way that they used to, the great thing about brands like those is they're able to bring that community into the homes. And I think it goes back to the emotional connection. And that's one thing that SoulCycle was really, really known for, for example, um, was that community. Um, and that's somewhat what we're missing now with the pandemic and not being able to have those same kind of connections with people. So brands like SoulCycle and Peloton and Mirror and all the other fitness, for example, um, are able to bring a community connection and bring groups together to have conversations and to feel connected, even if it is through a screen that's attached to your bike or a screen that's on your, your tablet. Um, so I think it is being able to tie in connection, even though it's virtual. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a bit. Um, how the pandemic and the job market. So how do you think it's influencing young professionals um, are they are are young professionals looking at non traditional career paths? Are they still hiring? I know for us, we continued GM continued with our internships. They were all virtual, and we went out of our way to change um, kind of the process and the way that we worked with the interns to try to ensure they still felt like they got a holistic experience, even though they weren't able to be in the office. And I did talk to a few of them, and while they did miss the connections, they still felt like the one-on-one -on -one meetings that they got with us and the virtual interaction helped. So how do we think that this has impacted um, maybe the job market and maybe any hints on how you might look at it differently, I think would be great. Um, Marissa, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, nowadays with distance learning, um, 
Zoom calls, both work, I believe, like now's the time that um, those in the job market are expanding on these softer skills that myself or people older than me may not have had. Um, for example, uh, coming from the LA office, my whole team is based in the New York office. So I would always be the person on Zoom while everyone else is in the conference room. Now with the pandemic, Zoom is like the great equalizer. Everyone is on here. Everyone has to be able to present on Zoom, communicate on Zoom, um, share their ideas on Zoom. So I believe that's like a soft skill that we may not, may not have had to lean into um, growing up in my age. I think that's a really great point. And, you know, even there was a whole conversation um, in an academia stream that I was in about how you look on your Zooms and, and does it matter anymore or has that equalized as well? But even for me at my age, I, I have on a WVU shirt, but I put on a jacket today because it still feels formal to me, right? But that's not, that won't be the future. That's, right. that's just me. So, um, Ugo, what about you? What do you think? Um, I also put on a jacket. I don't ever wear a jacket, but you know, I, I want to be a little more formal um, when these things are, you know, as posterity and all that stuff. Um, I'm a big believer in this season of life that we're in that we should all um, lean into becoming deep dive generalists. Um, this is a great time to learn a lot of skills and be able to come to the table with a lot of different stuff. Because a lot of us are working from home, remote, different spots, um, it, it's not the same um, as it's been in the past where you have a team of 15 people that do a little bit of here. We're all in different spots. We can all contribute in lots of different ways. So what a great time to learn a lot of different skills and bring them in. But I would caveat that. And those are the kinds of people that I'm um, looking to employ and work with right now. I'm working on hiring a project manager. And my challenge is, is everyone that I've interviewed has one specific skill set, and I need them to be able, I need to just give you the stuff and you need to just figure out all the different areas. I, I can't hold your hand on three of them because that's not going to work. So deep dive generalists, but know what you're talking about. Um, it's frustrating when someone comes in and says, I can do this, that, and the other, and then they really don't. Um, reading a Wikipedia article or taking a two minute YouTube class does not make you an expert on it. Be, be real, say what you know, and, and, and be cool about that. Um, but uh, deep dive generalist um, is where I lean into. Um, I call myself right now, when I talk to my clients, I call myself a full stack marketer, um, borrowing from the coding technology world. Um, see, Joseph's get, getting me, he's got the code in the background. A full stack marketer, knowing as many different skill sets as possible and being good at them and having experience. That would be my encouragement. Great, Joseph. I'm actually not real. I'm just code, uh, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, for, for this occasion, I actually put on a shirt today. So that was in a, you know, an upgrade for me. Um, <laughs> I, I actually think we're going to see some major, major changes uh, from a talent standpoint. And it's one of my real, you know, passion, you know, focus areas. Um, I am not overly bullish uh, about the big cities and specifically even New York City, because uh, I think it's tragic what happened that people were overpaying thousands of dollars for a tiny little apartment and then became essentially imprisoned in that uh, apartment. So perspective and priorities are going to change. Uh, for a long time, I've been saying that, that you know, the, the day and the age of lifers at companies are gone. Um, and, and, and the young talent base today is, is really more of a, you know, a freelancer or, or exploring that gig economy, you know, especially in this startup enabled world. So I do think what's going to happen is companies are going in, in order to attract and retain talent. Companies are going to have to demonstrate, you know, and if they don't glass door will demonstrate it for them, that when the pandemic hit and during tough times, that they didn't just whack their staff, right, that they didn't just uh, immediately cut costs in order to preserve those C-suite and board you know, parachutes and profits. Uh, companies are gonna need to demonstrate like Patagonia does or REI, that they are committed to, uh, to corporate social responsibility, to the environment, to community, uh, to cause marketing, uh, et cetera. And I think, you know, companies that are able to demonstrate a different kind of transparency, internal transparency, will have a better chance of being able to attract the best and the brightest um, but I think there's going to be a long period and a huge hangover 
um, where talent is not just going to flock back. Um, one of the things I've said is if you were unhappy and miserable in your job before, why on earth would you go back to that misery? Now's the time for a change. I think it's really interesting. I, I don't remember which, maybe it, it was one of the banks who said that they were suffering without having their workers in person. And I was quite floored because that was, they were the only company that had said that. And, and if I worked there, I think I would have had to take a step back to understand why they were saying that because most companies have had a very positive result from our new working environment. So Chauncey, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, absolutely. Like from a personal perspective. Um, so I think to Hugo's point, it's important to be ambidextrous and to speak multiple languages. And there's always things that need to be translated and explained and communicated. So I think that's the, the benefit and the opportunity for young people, but even for me. So I used to live in New York. Um, I moved to Chicago, then I lived in Dallas and now I'm in San Antonio because my fiance is in the military. And so it was challenging initially um, to try to find roles. There are jobs that I've interviewed with prior to the pandemic that were that said things like, are you going to move to L.A.? Will you move back to New York? Those kind of things. And now those same companies are calling me and I've had more business and more opportunities um, as of recent than ever before. So I think there's definitely an opportunity. And to Joseph's point, you know, companies are having to expand and to really um expand on their talent base in other locations. And it, I think there's a huge opportunity there. So I hope everyone feels encouraged by that because I know it's definitely been beneficial for me down here in rusty, dusty San Antonio. It's, it's, it, you brought back a memory for me, which was we used to have the, it's not McDonald's, you're not checking in and out or butts and seats checks. So I think, I hope to Joseph's point earlier that these are things that we're gonna leave in the past. I, you know, it's, we can work anywhere at any time. and. It's, I, I love it personally. <laughs> um, all right, one of the next questions I wanna talk about is some of the privacy concerns that were raised this year, specific to TikTok, but other platforms. Um, do you guys have any advice or thoughts on it or um, your take maybe? We can go in any direction on this one, I think. I recently had a conversation with a client um, that was um, struggling with their presence and, and what to do with it. And, and the advice that we were able to come together was as professionals, um, we need to either accept that we live in a digital world where the stuff that we publish gets seen somewhere or create two separate personas. Here's my work one, here's my private one. And this client was um, challenged because every time they posted something about their personal life, they found their team members commenting it or drop, dropping it in and they felt uncomfortable. Um, so she wanted to like separate herself um, and be able to, you know, talk about, you know, real housewives with uh, people, but not be judged by that lens when she was leading her team. Um, I, I lean into just be authentically you always, and then there's not a problem. Um, it's too much work for me to have to keep up multiple personalities and profiles and whatever but I'm very conscientious that what I'm putting out there is out there. And so I, I'm okay with living with whatever I've put out there. Um, I think, um, I don't see this getting less. I think technology is a part of our society. Um, I, I, I look at the recent laws that have been changing in Europe about privacy and how challenging that's making uh, marketing and engagement. Um, they're, they're trying to, to fix some of this, but it's not necessarily, um, making life easier for brands and products is so why I suspect some of those laws might even evolve as time goes on. It's, it's a, a little uh, above my pay grade, only in the sense that I'm not a day-to-day -day practitioner um, from my vantage point, but clearly from a thought leadership and a, and, and, and a content creation standpoint, I know enough about this to be dangerous. Um, but these are challenging times for marketers. And when you look at the, the death or the end of the cookie, and uh, you know CCPA and all of these uh, regulations. Um, if ever there was one message to marketers right now, it's you need, you know, <laughs> mission critical mission number one is to cultivate and curate uh, a database of of your customers. I mean, in other words, profiles and you know that even sounds you know icky the way I'm saying it. But in relationships, you know, know when your customer joined you, know when their birthday is, surprise them, delight them. Um, you know, the ability to actually have direct channels with your customer base is going to be, be
beyond mission critical. And then that, in addition to that, the creepiness part, I mean, right now, I mean, we all know this, right? We go on to, back in the day, you go to American Airlines and you'd like search for a flight to San Francisco. And then 12 seconds later on Instagram, you know, flights to San Francisco and in your inbox, you haven't finished your, your, you know, looking for your flight to San Francisco. And I'm like, it's beyond, it's relevant, but it's creepy. And, and that's going to be a battle. You know, sometimes relevance will win and sometimes creepiness will win. But, you know, the final thing I would say is I'm sure every single one of you, and if you haven't, you should go watch The Social Dilemma. Uh, and right at the end, you know, spoiler alert, just watch the credits. Because when you watch the credits, that's when the bomb drops and when you realize, you know, the mess that we're in and that we've actually created for ourselves. And will we be able to clean it up and get ourselves out? I don't know. Great points. Marissa or Chauncey, you wanna add anything? Yeah, um, when it comes to privacy to myself, I'm pretty apathetic about it. Like going back to Hugo's point, I know what I'm putting out there so I can kind of expect what to get back. But for example, Apple knows my thumbprint. They know my face. Um, I, I get more concerned when it is, you know, my baby boomer parents and they're leaning into tech and Zoom and Instagram. So whenever they click on a, or for example, I'm having a conversation with my mother about shopping for rugs, she'll get like an ad for rugs either in her inbox or on Instagram. And, you know, she thinks everything is real, legit and click through this person's information. So those are the times where I get a little concerned because there's that awareness that it is a ad and not necessarily um, something that could be a quality product. Uh, that's where I get hesitant of and making sure privacy is either more regulated or either in control um, for select audiences. Chauncey. Yeah, um, so one quick add to that is I've definitely had some experience as of recent working with brands who have had a lot of concerns with privacy and social media space. And so it's been challenging to have to pivot. So for example, my time with Essence, we had a lot of platforms to be able to partner on Facebook and on Instagram, and then certain brands just aren't um, leveraging those platforms with media partners. And so that becomes a challenge because then you have to pivot the overall media plan and find ways to regain those impressions and numbers that you were um, looking to um, adhere to. And then um, what kind of happens is things tend to continue to evolve and change and shift and is TikTok happening? Is it not? Is it going away? All those things, you really have to be very um, nimble in your approach and realize that, you know, today there could, it could be here, tomorrow it could shift, um, different parameters could be in place. So we've had to be very, very strategic in our media planning um, as it pertains to partnering with social media, just adhering to all of the various brand guidelines. Awesome. Um, I, I, this, I think we're going to wrap with this question, but um, it touched on something that I think Ugo had talked about and Joseph on related to podcasts. It was, you know, some of the podcasts have long, added long form video and how do you utilize that properly in a kind of go forward approach? Or do you think that is a good go forward approach? Ooh, I, I'll take this one. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick analogy. This is my favorite story now. A while back, a few years ago, I went to Mauritius. Uh, my best friend has a house in Mauritius. And we went out on his boat. This is a true story, by the way. Uh, it's not a crazy story, but it's a true story. And we went out and we caught a bunch of fish, you know, Wahoo, Bonita, Dorado. I've never done that before. It was kind of cool. Um, and we arrived back and, you know, our family's waiting for us. And there were a few people that work, you know, that, that work there. And immediately they took the fish and they put the fish on the hook. And there we are, we, you know, standing with the fish, you know, the proud fishermen. By the way, we did nothing. We just held the rod. We didn't even, we did nothing. But, we, you know, we posed, we took credit for the fish. And then they took this giant fish and they, and they slapped it on the ground and they started to gut the fish. And it got a bit gross. And then they picked it up and they disappeared. We went to the beach. And we're drinking rum and coke and having a grand old time. And the next thing we know, about four people arrive with platters of the most incredible Nobu style sushi. Sushi and sashimi and rolls and maki. It was just incredible. Colors and, you know, and, and, and flowers made of tomato, et cetera. That is the analogy for content. 
when you create a piece of video, a 60 minute, like every day of my show is 60 minutes, that is the big fish. And then you gut it and then you create audio transcripts, uh, you audio, you know, the, the audio version, a transcript, a soundbite, um, you know, Instagrammable, uh, Instagrammable images, quotes, one page of PDF takeaways, all of these like micro versions of video as well. This is what, this is content strategy in a nutshell. You start off with video. Video is sight, sound, and motion. What I didn't realize with Joe Rogan and Tim Ferriss and all of their podcasts is they're all video, but you don't even know them for video. They just happen to have all this video. So you start off with sight, sound, and motion, and then you unpack it and, and dissect it and gut it and create your sight, your sound, your motion, um, and, and a thousand different versions of it. Uh, and, and by the way, if you can't find the nuggets from 60 minutes of content, then you just aren't looking hard enough. Um, so it's knowing where to start and where you start is with video and then backing your way, not backing your way, actually earning your way into all of these possibilities. Yeah, I, I, I call that the content ripple, um, Joseph. Um, I start with that anchor content. The only variation I will give is not every brand can do video. Um, although video is so important, that's why I think the podcast is really good. Or for some, it might be a deep dive um, blog post that's really relevant and really meaty. But whatever it is, start with an anchor piece and then ripple it across. I think you're spot on in that approach. In terms of video tied into podcast specifically on that question, Whitney, I think, um, again, one of the lessons that we're learning from the pandemic is that people have an appetite for, for good content. And so you're not doing video necessarily just because, you're doing video because there are some people that will enjoy that as well, or because that's gonna give you more content to ripple across along the way. And it doesn't cost you anything extra to turn on your Zoom while you're doing your podcast and capture that as well. Capture all the content you can. You never know what you're gonna be able to do with it. Okay, thanks. Chauncey, you wanna add anything? Sure. Um, so when I think about podcasts that have done well, as far as um, going from the actual audio to video, I think about like The Breakfast Club, for example, um, which is an entity that I work with closely. Um, and I think that they've done it very, very well. Um, and I think the important part is making sure that there is an engaging um, content that the video is going to be entertaining to watch. I mean, because I, for the longest time, have not been a fan of podcasts. Like, I just do not want people talking at me for hours on end, just couldn't get into it. I've begun to evolve and um, get into it into a different way. Um, but yeah, I just think it's a matter of really understanding, you know, your audience and finding the the hook in the content. Obviously, the, the overall conversation is something, but how else do you make it more engaging um, from a video perspective to keep that same level of excitement that you have from just the audio. It was also with audio, what I'm realizing now as I evolve in my podcast journey is that it does allow you the imagination to think about what's happening versus actually seeing it. Um, so I think it's twofold. It can be done well, we've seen it done well. Um, and I've also seen some that I'm like, I would rather just turn this video off and just listen. So it kind of goes both ways, but it's interesting to see it evolve for sure. Great, thanks. Marissa? Yeah, I'm, I'm basically Chauncey from before evolving. Like I'm not too big into podcasts, but from what I've seen, um, the audio space, like for me, it's not for me. I, I need to look and see what's happening. Um, but I wanted to take that point and say that there is extreme opportunity for it. I've seen this new social media network come out called Clubhouse. I'm sure a couple of you are familiar with mm -hmm. it, but it is audio only tried it out. I couldn't get into it either, but the fact that this exists because there is a, a space for it, it's very interesting to see. And it's, there's no video, it's all voice. So you're seeing this person's image and you're hearing their voice and they're going back and forth and uh, engaged in conversation. So um, yeah, to me, it, going back to Ugo's and um, Joseph's point is going back on your content strategy. Like if this is a fit for your brand, then of course, explore all those lanes. Um, but yes, definitely lean into the strategy. Awesome. With that, I want to thank everyone for joining us with particular thanks to Ugo, Marissa, Joseph, and Chauncey for uh, doing the panel today. It was amazing. Awesome. Really enjoyed it.
Uh, be sure to visit integratewvu.edu for upcoming sessions, recording of previous episodes, and to subscribe to receive updates. So I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks again for being with us. Great session. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.